so it's time and we would like to start now and uh, so i i would like to welcome everyone including the speaker to this evening lecture and this is part of as as every time in this this set of lectures now see women in science lecture series we are telling about the whole idea that national academy of sciences india is always interested to get it attached with the society and to take science to society and there is a dedicated program on science on so science and society and this lecture is part of nashi's initiatives towards that and instead of i elaborating that in the same line at every day i am doing i would like to request professor ghatak to tell a bit about nashi and its social initiatives before we start today's talk professor ghatak kindly <laughs> tell something well, about nasi that was not part of the program <laughs> <laughs> no no i am sure everyone present here knows about nasi too well but this program that uh, anirban professor anirban patak and professor papia choudhury have initiated in bringing in successful and uh, women who have contributed immensely to the society and uh, motivating other young women to do Uh, outstanding work in their lifetime so that is really a great initiative that has been taken by the delhi chapter and i am really very proud to be associated with that of course today's speaker is extremely well known and i am sure professor uh, uh, patak will give a formal introduction but uh, in the past we have had some excellent lectures outstanding lectures and uh, given by very successful and uh, committed women who have who have contributed not only to science but also to the society so i mean indeed very happy anirban wanted me i mean he just now said that i should speak something about nasi so uh, uh, what i always say is uh, nasi as you all know is the oldest science academy in india was founded by the great visionary and astrophysicist uh, professor megnat saha and uh, although he was he he deserved the nobel prize for his outstanding work in aust- astrophysics but what i would like to credit him more is the creation of a large number of institution that he did in his lifetime from from the establishment of this great academy to the establishment of the what is now known as saha institute of nuclear physics to the central glass ceramic research institute to the position astronomy center and so many institutes and he died at a very early age i mean i feel that today we have a vibrant science community and that is because of people like uh, homi bhaba abdul kalam megnat saha and uh, ss bhatnagar vikram sarabhai so we today of course require the nobel prize winning scientists but what is more important in my opinion is uh, our people who have the vision for creating a large number of institutes where young younger people uh, men and women can contribute more effectively to the to the country at large so uh, so i'm really very proud to be associated with this great academy and uh, the local chapters are doing outstanding work in promoting the uh, the mandate of our academy and particularly the delhi chapter uh, i'm very happy that uh, they have started this uh, lecture series of visionary women and today we are going to hear from professor saha who is who is not only an outstanding scientist but also the president of the most important academy in our country the indian national science academy with that few words anirban you take over and uh, thank you, you sir um, thank you professor ghatak and now i would like to request my colleague professor papia choudhury to introduce today's speaker welcome you all um, this uh, fifth lecture of the um, women in science lecture series which um, uh, jp institute of information technology and uh, nasi we are conducting so without delaying um, much time uh, let me introduce uh, <coughs> dr chandrima saha dr chandrima saha is a biologist 
and she is the current president of uh, Indian National Science Academy, which is the premier body of science in India. She is also the first woman president of INSA, and she is also the Jessie Bose uh, Chair, distinguished professor at the Indian Institute of Chemical Biology at Calcutta. She is also the former director of the National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi. Dr. Saha graduated from Calcutta University in West Bengal and completed her doctoral degree in 1980 from Indian Institute of Chemical Biology. Her research interests centers around the elucidation of the processes that influence the cell death <coughs> programs under varying physiological conditions in diverse organisms. She is an elected fellow of the World Academy of Sciences and fellow of all three science academies of India. She served as a member in the councils or of all three national academies. Her notable awards include the Ranbaxy Science Foundation Award for Basic Sciences, the J.C. Bose Fellowship, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Medal of INSA, Om Prakash Bhashin Award, Archana Sharma Memorial Award, Darshan Ranganathan Memorial Award, Chandrakala Hora Memorial uh, Medal, and Sakuntala Amit Chand Prize. So I welcome uh, Madam Chandrakala Saha to deliver her lecture and enlighten um, us. Thank you very much, Professor Chaudhary, for a very um, generous introduction. And I must say that it is a real pleasure to be speaking on this forum. And uh, Professor Ghatak, Professor Datta, Professor Mittal, uh, and of course, I must thank Professor Patak and Professor Chaudhary for both for arranging this uh, lecture. And this series is going on very well, as I know. Um, uh, it has this connotation of women in science. So, you know, in my lecture, I shall dwell on the subject of women in science in the later part of my lecture. But as I gave my title as engagement in science, I think that is something very important. And one needs to speak about that in order to um, get the young people more interested in science and get uh, uh, if, if men and women both take part in equal uh, numbers, then we will have a scientific workforce which is diverse. Which is, uh, which is very enabling. And so I think uh, that part I will uh, address later. And now I will share my slides and try to address some issues on engagement in science. Um, yes, now I will share just a second. Share screen. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, it yes. is visible. It's yes. Visible. Yes. Okay. yes, we can. Nice All slide. Right. So, yes. So, so I'll just. Uh, so, screen. I, uh, you know, uh, yeah, my title is Improving Engagement in Science, and actually, it's a challenge. The reason I put this particular uh, painting in the title slide is because it's a very famous pa painting by Raphael painted in 16th century. And it has, it is in the Vatican Museum and it has stalwarts like uh, Socrates, Aristotle. I mean, this is Aristotle, this is Plato, and then Euclid and Euclid here. And so number of people like Ptolemy, Archimedes, Pythagoras, uh, Michelangelo. So what it essentially this uh, painting conveys is that the unification of all, we have to have unification of all disciplines to obtain a holistic view of our existence. So that is very important. And I think uh, while we talk about women in science and men in science and all that, we must also unify our different disciplines and appreciate all disciplines to bring about you know, a more uh, appreciation of nature and more holistic understanding. So when we talk about creating an interest, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is how do we create an interest? So increased awareness in scientific matters can be achieved by presenting the facts in an understandable and enjoyable way. The reason, as I go on with my talk, you will see that with the changing generation, the approaches of presenting the facts in an understandable and enjoyable way has also, uh, has also undergone an evolution. So this sort of helps in opinion forming and the feeling that science is attractive and it is an integral part of our lives. 
this is something that students and everyone should appreciate that it is an integral part of our lives. And it has, after the pandemic, I think people have started appreciating that. Um, success in science communication, it depends how good the uh, communicator is. So there should be a trust with the audience through understandable and attractive discourses. And I think the students, what they should do is to try communicating science with a general non-scientific audience. So their practice of communicating science, communicating science in this way will enable them when they become scientists to be in touch with the public and provide, um, provide their inputs in a very lucid language to make it enjoyable for everyone. So the belief in science, you know, better sci communication of science related information is essential. And it often can confu give confusing matters, which lead to somewhat mistrust between the public and the scientists. So, and also frequently people disbelieve scientifically supported information when they feel that they must do so to protect deeply held values. Now, deeply held values is something which is integral to our culture. So we have to override that, or we have to respect that also to bring in the, uh, bring, in, bring in the belief in science. So we need to communicate not only information, but I think it is very important to communicate how the process of science works. Because frequently during the pandemic, People were getting so impatient about the vaccine, about the um, diagnostic, about the treatment, because they don't know what, how the process works, how long does it take. So that information we have not really communicated very well. So um, also they need to be told about the rigor and rigor of scientific in investigation and evidence generation. That is what I have felt during the pandemic then we have not explained the process very well. Um, also the demarcation between, uh, between the pseudoscience from real science is a little problematic. And the ability to recognize the fuzzy science from convincing evidence-based scientific data is something that needs to be communicated to the stakeholders. That is very important. And we have seen problems with pseudoscience. So we need to work very hard at it. Now we live in a technologically technological and a risky world. If you look around that you will see that there were the Chernobyl disaster, there, are, uh, there was the bird flu scare, there was the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, the Bhopal grass tragedy, the forest fires, and more recently, the coronavirus. So this is, our society has become so technologically savvy. We are having many kinds of, and we don't know what is what we are going to have tomorrow. So, but it is very important to uh, communicate this as there are many questions once these kind of things happen that after a nuclear disaster, the question comes is what is a nuclear fallout? Effects of radiation, effects on health, irradiated food, are they safe? Are nuclear installations safe? So this is something that we need to communicate to the public. And like with the coronavirus, it was like it's a virus, but why it is uh, mutating so much? How is it preventable? And what is the real effect on health? So there has been frequent communication on the, on the popular media channels, but I think we should be very careful when communicating this information and do so with responsibility. Well, like why there are so many SARS-CoV-2 strains, as I said, and why is science not able to stop this? So one has to be very patient and explain this to them. Now, after the Bhopal ga gas tragedy, there were questions like, what is this methyl isothiocyanate? Most of the people have not heard name of the gas. And then it came, how can it affect us? And which industries can endanger our lives? There are industries spread all over. So which are the industries that can endanger? And what is the influence of forest fires, fires on our environment and health? How is it preventable? So there are multiple questions that come. And what happens is if we do not responsibly address these, then protests come like no more Fukushima's, Chernobyl's or Bhopal's. And we are having problems in putting nuclear installations for peaceful use of nuclear energy. Then no COVID vaccine. So there was this issue of vaccine hesitancy and that can really worsen an epidemic or a pandemic because that is the, for if you look at the history, the smallpox, the polio, 
that all these diseases have been fought only by vaccines. So vaccines are very important and the, the giving wrong information would entail, you know, uh, uh, a wrong impressions in the society. So what we should have, prob we have done this and uh, from INSA has also tried to do this, that, you know, for vaccines, we have the first line of defense, some cells like dendritic cells and macrophages. And then we have a second li line of defense. For the first line of defense, they just uh, give the message to the next set of cells like the B cells that this is the, it actually reveals the identity of the pathogen and, and initiates the helper T cells to tell the B cells to make antibodies. And also there's some cytotoxic T cells to kill the pathogens. So making of antibodies is a very important issue and people should understand that. For example, I put this uh, uh, figure here is that when the, the first line of defense cells are actually speaking to something called T cells in our body, they, um, they communicate the identity of the pathogen. And then these T cells through very complex, inter uh, complex molecular interactions actually tells the B cells to mature. So B cells are the cells that actually uh, will eventually produce the antibodies. So here, this is also a very wonderful picture of a, of a, of a, of a phagocytic cell on which a T cell is sitting and taking the message from the phagocytic cells and the pathogens, while the pathogens are being engulfed. So finally, the plasma cell that comes out of the B cell generates the antibodies. This, this is the same way that vaccines work. This is a pathogen. We are pro protecting ourselves from the pathogen by the same method by which the, the, um, uh, the, the B cells manufacture when the vaccines are given, the B cells manufacture the antibodies and protects us. So these kind of information is very important to go in a, in a very lucid way to be explained to the general public. And also we should uh, make aware people about the emerging infections that are coming. So the new or re-emerging infections are the infections that were either previously unknown infectious agents, they have evolved over time, or known pathogens whose role in specific diseases have previously gone unrecognized, known infectious agents that have spread to new geographic locations or new populations, re-emergence of pathogens, known agents that have mutated to new forms, and very importantly, agents that are transmitted by zoonotic transmissions. We are very close to the animals. And what happens is that if we tread into their territory, which we are doing, and if there are some, um, you know, uh, uh, contact with them, whether it is intentional or unintentional, there is a risk of being infected by many of the viruses that they harbor. So this zoonotic transmission has become a problem because of the, the because of the because of many issues like. Uh, uh, land reorientation, etc., and so we should be very um, careful and try to limit these kind of uh, exposures. Uh, so the exposure to wildlife also we ha having sometimes, and we have to reduce the pests like mosquitoes, flies, etc., and limit the land exp expansion. There are many factors that actually uh, create this emergence that I'll just show in one slide. But these are this is a this is a slide this is a slide which was made by CDC in September 2017. After that, it's been several years, and this must have improved. But I haven't got that slide. But you can see that so many emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases are actually attacking the world. And to add it to it all, there is one black spot here which says that it is deliberately emerging. So all we have to live with all these. So now the uh, major contributors to emergent infectious diseases that we should also tell uh, that climate change, human demographic changes, there are, uh, there are industry practices without regulations. There are changes in land use patterns, increase in international travel and commerce, microbial adaptation and change, and in general, the breakdown in healthcare. So we have to take care of all these to, to um, to, uh, to uh, counter this emergent infectious diseases. And the society has to be conscious on this. So we need to convey this in a very lucid language to the society 
to, to remain aware of what can happen. <clears throat> now, there is the, the, we are racing against pathogens. There's one simple thing I want to say is the pathogens are at an advantage because they divide very fast within few hours. And we actually have a life of, uh, you know, uh, a reproductive life of about 30, 40 years. And so we can change very slowly, but a pathogen can change very fast. So we are in this constant battle where selective forces of natural selection are actually acting on the pathogen to create an infection in us. And the uh, selective forces are also acting on the host to improve upon the tools that the host has to combat the pathogen. But here we have to constantly uh, keep a vigil and develop ways to avoid the pathogen because we cannot mute it and change like so fast like them. <clears throat> So here I wanted to bring up a point of misinformation versus true information. See, when the president of the United States comes and says, I'm not a big believer in global warming, it's very damaging because we are seeing the effects of global warming with only one degree change in temperature. There are increased forest fires, there are floods, there, there, there are earthquakes, and we keep on burning the fossil fuels and we are actually making our planet more hotter and with the increasing carbon emission, there are challenges we're facing every day with, with, the, with, the, with, with the natural disasters. So this is an iconic picture. See, when we are communicating science, we should do it in a very emphatic way. This is an iconic picture, I think, where it shows that due to the melting of the glaciers, this polar bear is holding on to the last piece of ice because that's, that was his habitat, which is gone. Then you have this picture is from Rio de Janeiro where scores of fishes, dead fish has come. That is due to pollution, that is due to warming. So the climate change is having a range of impacts on health and this will become more severe unless urgent action is taken. And it will affect the poorer section, poorer people who are actually not responsible for uh, you know, global warming. The vulnerable populations will see their health increasingly undermined by both direct impacts, such as extreme heat, indirect ones from <coughs> reduced food, food and nutrition security. So this is, these are, these are some of the pictures which actually tell a, a big story. And this gets into us. So it is very important in, 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 in getting people interested is to show these kind of uh, pictures and photographs and give commentaries with that. So if we look at communication directly to the public by scientists themselves, we can go back to history and see the very, very famous uh, lecture series was called Christmas Lecture Series by Michael Faraday. It was started in 1825 at the, uh, at the Royal Institution in England. And he gave his famous lecture series, The Chemical History of a Candle. And in doing so, he taught young boys in the audience about boys and girls, both in the audience about the physics and chemistry behind one of the most essential items in their homes, the candle. So this lecture is still held now, but it is called a Faraday lecture now. So there is an impact when there are communication by the scientists themselves to the public. Then there was this famous um, Huxley Wilberforce debate, which also happened in England, when both Thomas Huxley and Samuel Wilberforce, who was the, uh, uh, who was the uh, Bishop of Oxford and Huxley who was uh, an English biologist, had a, he had a huge debate in public debate at the end of which Huxley ended with saying that he was not ashamed to have a monkey as an ancestor, but that he would be ashamed to be connected with a man with a clouded judgment. This was in the backdrop of Darwin's theory of evolution, where he predicted that humans evolved from. So this also had a major impact on the, on the public opinion. And then we, you know, very famous astronomer Carl Sagan, he brought cosmos to our homes. He taught us, he showed us to think about the stars, what the, the, the galaxy that we live in, other galaxies. And he 
said that science is a way of thinking much more than it is a body of knowledge. It is a goal to find out how the world works, to seek what irregularities are there may be, and to penetrate the connections of things from subnuclear particles, which may be constituents of all matter, to all living organisms, to eventually the human social community, and then to the cosmos as a whole. So his cosmos series really stirred many people and got many people interested in, in how we connect to nature. Uh, the Origins project was a big project in the US, which where the, uh, the discussions were held in public halls. You can imagine that Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, the two celebrated scientists, talking to an audience in the City Fort Auditorium in Delhi. I mean, it's like, it's so exciting. So this also interested the public. So this is one thing that we have not really uh, attempted to do. And I'm sure that people will be interested if we, if we get our scientists um, yeah, to talk to the public in a public forum like this. So there will be, there will be you know, questions and there will be uh, discussions. So that is how we get the society in general interested in addition to students, teachers, whoever is there. So now uh, I wanted to just give, an, give examples of communication through senses. This is an installation. This is actually an art installation. And it is, it is a chamber where you can walk in and um, they, the visitors will find themselves surrounded by millions of animated and illuminated data points. Uh, and there is a soundscape also going along with it. And that is a sound of the, the molecules colliding with each other. And this was observed via the Atlas detector, a particle physics experiment run within the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So um, the view, viewers can sit, they can stand, they can lie down, and they can, they can actually experience that the moment that maybe the universe when it was created. So in art and science, the collective experience hold a huge capacity in the cultivation and development of understanding, action, and emotion. And to keeping in mind the new generation, the, there are many attempts have come in and where you know this covalent bonding has been sung by this uh, student as covalent love in the studio. And there they use the DNA models to use the rap dance, A T C G C G A T, like that. And so that also interests people. So keeping the mind in the new generation, there are very novel ways. Today only I saw that the India Bioscience <coughs> is uh, doing. Um, how cancer cells live <coughs> by through memes. Memes is a very uh, new thing with all these Twitter and Instagram, etc. So they are trying to convey it through memes to approach the new generation. Um, then science and the performing arts. You know, the American Association of Advancement of Science has come up with a program where they say dance your PhD contest, which means that you have to express your work through dance. And that has worked very well and there is a yearly competition. And so the AAS has uh, brought, made it a regular feature now. So this is one of the ways to approach people also. So what we really need is to reach young people to shape rational thinking and to shape the experts of tomorrow. For the future of our economies, environments and societies, it's critical that the next generation of talented people embrace a career in science. So whatever way we need, we need to get them interested. <coughs> One clear aim of science communication, <coughs> sorry, is to inspire better understanding of science by policymakers. Ideally, this can lead to evidence-based public policy and decision-making by governments across the board. So nature had a, uh, had a, had a issue on building the 21st century scientist. Um, yeah. But, you know, narration, narrations are very important in the sense that if you look at preschool, school, college, university, and the public, narrative thinking followed by understanding, conceptual clarification, and motivation is important. Now, one example that how simple narratives work, it bring, can bring about social change of behavior. You see how not to wear a mask. So this is a very simple, you know, issue. 
And this has shown that without protective measures, you get a curve like this. But when you have the, um, when you have conveyed this idea that you have to wear a mask properly, the, the curve actually flattens out. I think, you know, people were told that if one person coughs, it goes directly to you and you have to protect yourself wearing the mask. And this person also has to uh, put a mask. So use of masks has greatly helped in spreading of this disease. And this simple narrative has actually brought in a societal change in behavior. So this is uh, also these narratives are also very important to get across. Now, coming to uh, the role of in, in, in a collective way, this all these communication signs should, should percolate into all, both genders. So if, if we see society is composed of 50% men and 50% women, but when you look at the um, when you look at the balance in scientific uh, people working in scientific environments, you see that women are actually less than men. The the balance is tilted towards the men. Um, but if both are participating in equal amounts, there will be diversity, and the progress of science benefiting society will naturally be more more. So. Why less women? So this is a crucial question. When I was talking about the communication of science, is it because we are communicating less science to women? No. You know, it's a, we need to look at this problem more critically as it is very complex in nature and varies according to culture, countries, and social situations. So we need to encourage more women to come into science and sustain them because there are issues with women. So we have to really help them to sustain in science. And a nation really needs all the talent, all the ideas and creativity of all its people. So participation of 30% women has to be increased. And diverse teams could generate more. It, this has been scientifically shown that diverse teams could generate more different ideas and innovative solution to problems. In the context of COVID-19, this issue, this issue has been proven by widespread spread collaborations, bringing in people from different countries together. And that has shown what diversity can do. But one thing is about, we have been discussing about participation of women for a very long time, maybe almost 30 years. Then why is it not happening? Strong arguments are being raised that majority of the interventions meant to promote women in science have been guided by inconsistent understanding and oversimplification of problems. So what is it due to gender differences or social inequalities? Now, interestingly, if you see, look at Finland, Finland is a country that excels in gender equality with girls actually outperforming boys in science. But in as such, Finland have less gender gap in STEM fields, if you, if you look at the population who is taking on science. But the opposite to true, it has one of the lowest proportions of women in, in uh, earning STEM degrees, uh, and along with Norway and Sweden, which also rank higher in gender equality. So what is actually the reason? I still think that we need to look at it more uh, in terms of uh, society, in terms of why this is happening that when girls are turning out to be better than boys, but why they are not getting, uh, taking the degrees uh, in STEM fields. Surprisingly in Algeria, the reverse is the case. So now uh, there's a very positive uh, thing about uh, women in uh, scientists of India. The Eric Falt, who is the Southeast Asia director of UNESCO, has said that a braided river never falters on its way to the sea, just as Indian women scientists invariably demonstrate intellect, grit, and power in the accomplishment of their personal and professional quests. So I think this, was, this is a recognition that we should feel proud of and think that we are in a very, um, we should be very optimistic about the uh, role of women in science in India. I'm, I think we're doing better than many countries. 
if you look by this is the niti aayog data i think and it it says that in phds the uh, from 2010 to 11 this is just a 10 year survey that um, uh, the in the, there is an increase in people in females taking um, uh, in women taking more degrees and in the post graduate there is a definitely more increase of women going in and in the undergraduates also there is an increase so compared to the uh, compared to the men which is declining the the gender in the we should be we should be optimistic that the women are taking part more in scientific um, endeavors uh, this is a data compiled by the ministry of human resource development in india so also if you look at women in stem the the medical graduates they outnumber uh, uh, outnumber the uh, men in women are more and there are there is an increase in women enrollment in the top uh, institutes and so when you look at women pis um, for example in this i think this is the dst data in 2020 that the number of women pis are also steadily increasing so it is a very optimistic situation for women in science in india although we need to really facilitate women and i'm sure we'll have more uh, participation you look at this this is about female female per 100 male students in key programs this i should report and here you see that in the in the in the uh, as compared to the arts in the science there is a increase of women taking part so for the future of women in leadership we have to look into the past because I, here i am talking about role models because is it true that women always face problems are the women that we look up to as a role models are they very different did they face difficulties what kind of struggle they had and what made them succeed in that the first name that comes is mary curie who was the first woman to win a nobel prize only woman in history to ever win it twice and the only human to ever win a nobel prize in two different sciences she was something different but if you look at her struggles then you know she um russian government prevented college for her uh, mary was not allowed to present seminars only his, her husband could at a time the nobel committee wanted to give nobel to to men and not marry never elected to the french academy of sciences not offered professorship till pierre died and second nobel prize came in controversy because of some affair so um so it is and and what she did she coined the term radioactivity she did groundbreaking discoveries regarding uranium rays she discovered the radioactive element polonium isolated radioactive element all her discoveries changed society and science forever but she had so here the most important thing is her grit is her passion and that is very important for women scientists to have grit passion and liking for the subject that they are handling closer to home this is a woman who is dr muthu lakshmi reddy and is a legendary medical practitioner and social reformer who was born in the devdasi community and she created the adiyar cancer center which is a huge has treated millions of cancer patients looked after her by dr vishanta and you can look at the institution building capacity of these two women who actually treated socially who did this socially important contribution and um, this 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 cancer hospital was solely by the effort of muthu lakshmi reddy so so institution building for women is also uh, something that women are very, very capable of and we should be very proud of that ida shadar was a missionary but she was a woman so she came to india and the velour christian medical college hospital at velour was created by her not many of us know that but it was created by a woman who started with a clinic on the roads and eventually it became asia's foremost teaching hospitals the christian medical college then mary punen lucos who established the formidable healthcare system in kerala 
And she was the founder of a tuberculosis sanatorium in Nagarkoil, and later, which later grew to become the Kanakumari Government Medical College. She founded the X-ray and Radium Institute in Tiruvananthapuram. She was the head of health department of the princely state of Travancore and was the first woman legislator of the state. So these examples I showed uh, to, to say that women can build wonderful institutes, passion, great determination. So these are very important things. You can wade through all the difficulties. Now, women force in science will be women in science administration, teachers of science subjects, technicians in science laboratories, women entrepreneurs in science, women researchers in science, and women students in science. So there are various categories of women uh, involved in the scientific endeavors of the country, and all needs to be supported with women-friendly um, uh, women uh, facilities in all all, all the places that they work. Now, Niti Aayog has come, up, come out with one, one um, data that uh, women generally, after before the first child is born, 30% women actually uh, go away from science. After the first child, about 37% go away. Second child, 17%. And pre-marriage, 14%. So these are social issues for women. They have to go through the life cycle. And so to make this a better world for them, we need to uh, provide facilities so that they can still come and work or encourage work from home. But science, you have to come to the laboratories. So there are, there are issues that we are, many issues have been built in. And India is doing very well because our number of women voters have increased. And over 15%, at over 15%, India has the highest percentage of women pilots in the world. So it's a very optimistic scenario for Indian women. Now, in the, in the science and technology, national science and technology and innovation policy of 2020 and the national education policy 2020, the, the, there are a clear and precise commitments to gender equity and universal inclusion, which are part of the sustainable development goals. And our government has, uh, the government of India has started the Gati Charter, which is, um, which is, which will ensure gender um, equality and parity. And all these can be provided to women to help. But as I'm saying, that it's important that women actually, uh, you know, have their own grit and determination. I had some uh, recommendations, but you know, exposure to science events is important. One must have a dream. And uh, in general, the first step of becoming a participant in science-related activities is something that we need to push women and men also. And students should know about their role models. Uh, and I already talked about determination and passion and problems of uh, women in different layers of society joining the science trip should be an, analyzed and addressed. Schools and universities should take steps for gender sensitization. Exposure to role models should be there. Counseling should be done for women. Then leadership, uh, women should be also, uh, women and both men should be, should be mentored for leadership. And uh, we should implement policies, making it easier for women to make a career choice. So, um, Financial support and uh, you know uh, uh, for uh, and women entrepreneurs and we should promote a mentoring system. Gender inclusive network benefits are necessary. So I wanted to end by saying this: some of the women scientists of India that I am, uh, you know, I've put forward in this in this montage that we know so much yet we do not know enough. So we need to continue doing science and involve as many people as we can. Thank you very much. Can I unshare my... Yes, I mean, thank you for a very nice talk. And it went almost from, to every domain means from Carl Sagan's cosmology to virus uh, and Raphael's <laughs> painting to the Indian scientist, Mary Curie means... It, it covered more or less means the entire domain of STEM and everybody, whatever be their specific subject area must have something to carry and thanks for a nice talk. And now it's open for, uh, open for 
questions or comment Actually, it's open for interaction so any question or comment from the participants i have a question please uh, continue uh, ma'am thank you very much for this uh, nice uh, presentation um yes sir uh, marik yeah i would like to uh, just uh, have an answer for this thing that uh, there was a big scientific conference in 1927 solvay conference for physicists and chemists yes together, yes and yes. there was only one woman uh, yes. among uh, 29 scientists and it was mary curie yes 95 95 years down the line uh, mm. this year there was again mm. another uh, solvay conference where yes. eight eight women were present women scientists were present uh, among 48 uh, of total scientists so it looks like a, a number going from 3% uh, uh, you know female population increasing to like 16% in 95 years uh, yes. so how do you comment on uh, i mean this progress is it good enough or do we do we kind of have a metric that we can say i mean if this progress is good at good enough i do not think that this is uh, really a good enough uh, progress but you know uh, this is very somehow it is also related to a subject because uh, the physicists in the um, in the first solve conference uh, picture that you saw there were so many stalwart so many famous um, scientists and had only one mary curie but the solve conference now has they should be having much more women because i looked at the picture also the, in the current pictures that i was a little bit surprised that it didn't increase further so what is there as i told you about the story of finland norway and uh, all these places that they uh, you know they 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 are so equal in everything in gender wise but then you don't get in stem field so many uh, women coming in why is so we maybe we are not understanding the real problem here thank you ma'am that answer my question i would just like to add one more question to this uh, so i mean where is the problem more women getting started or more women staying in science i think it is more women uh, if you look at the data in india uh, more women staying in science is a thing because sometimes as i said that i as i showed you the niti ayog uh, uh, niti ayog uh, you know that chart that how women has to um, has has actually uh, gone uh, no i don't think i have shown that that post uh, post graduation there is a drop in women and after the first child there is a drop so we need to give uh, see a man and woman consti- constitutes a family so both of them have the responsibility so we need to give such facilities that both of them can share like for example having a good crash in an institute so either the husband or the or the wife can come and put their child over there feel secure that their child is safe and i have seen uh, in certain institutes that practice is being followed but most of the institutes don't so sustainability is the problem rather than joining because more people are joining in science but the sustaining the interest is one thing sustaining uh, you know a, with the family is another thing so even if they are interested they may not be able to continue because of some of the issues with like this so sustainability is the main problem i think thank you ma'am so sure. uh, i guess uh, uh, please go very continue. nice talk thank you so much for the very nice talk so uh, as you told that there are many initiatives are there for uh, women to stay in science so are there any other uh, methods like apart from counseling and fresh any anything else that should be done to for the women to stay in science you see there are <clears throat> there are fellowships now that once you have a career break you can come back to science that is a government initiative and uh, uh, there are uh, there are there are in addition to that there are fellowships that uh, if you look at the dst site there are many women for friendly programs they have so i think we are doing very well but it is uh, we have actually not evaluated what are the impact of these programs 
like there is a bio care that's I think of DBT and th there are DST programs also. So if we have evaluated these programs, how well they're do doing, then we could bring in changes that are more effective. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, but uh, it's important when you get it, because if you don't get it at the proper time, then probably it doesn't give you the advantage that you can have. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I have a small question. Yes. In one of your slides, you have shown that when we are, ever we are making contact with these animals from where we are getting the yes, virus yes. and bacteria. So yes. to avoid uh, this, uh, um, uh, if you don't want to take that virus and bacteria, so is it necessary that we should avoid having those, uh, you can say that meat or this thing as a food item? It will be oh good. no i i see we 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 cook our foods well mm. and uh, that's one thing that i don't think is a problem uh, but what happened with this uh, the coronavirus there they anticipated that there was a spillover from the one market where mm. they they don't they sometimes use raw meat you know so those are the things but if even the close proximity because bats Bats are in very close proximity to us and they can harbor 150 varieties of virus. So, uh, you know, they are in very close proximity. You know, if, if you just go out in the, in the, towards the dusk, you see the bats flying over. And so they, we are in close contact with them, but uh, I don't think eating meat will cause any, uh, if you cook them well, there will be no, it is not known that, you know, cooked meat is transmitting virus. So it's, but it's just important to avoid the close contacts with wildlife and reduce our pests. And with all these changes that are happening, you know, we are encroaching in their territory. So. Um, there is a question from Nikita in the chat room. Is, yes. If your mic, mic is working, Nikita, why don't you ask it? I can, I can read her question. Uh, okay. Actually, I'm not sure. Yeah, so she says that uh, what are the different modes of communicating science? Like you said, communication through senses. Are there specific scientific ways of communicating to people? Sometimes lack of communication lead to less women in science. Uh, <clears throat> yes, um, uh, through senses, I was talking in a different connotation, but uh, there are we when we are communicating with people, we are actually uh, using the scientific jargon, and we are making science more easier for them to understand. So that is sort of a scientific way of communicating with people. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure if lack of communication can lead to uh, less women in science. So, uh, so I don't think that is the reason but when i was talking about communication through senses i meant that even in art you know there is an example i can give you one example is that when einstein and pablo picasso were at the same you know were at the same time in history and both were looking at the same thing they were looking at a space where they knew the conventional ways of thinking were not helping and picasso discovered cubism and einstein discovered e equal to mc square and so you know communicating science through the senses it's like a, it's a it's a holistic thing so i don't think you know women you have to have any special way to communicate to women our brains are the same so the reception is important reception is important in many ways so um, i think one has to be receptive to to sort of understand so there is another question in the chat room so dhruva jyoti is is your mic not working so, yeah, uh, actually, I am in the airport, so a lot of disturbances. That's why I thought. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, so, okay. I, that's what precisely I pointed out in one of my slides that, um, you know, we, we maybe we are not able to pinpoint the exact thing that would improve it for this, uh, this further. Many of the recommendations that I have put there, some of them are yes, some of them are have been 
um, you know, um, uh, initiated, but we have not evaluated their impact, first of all. And secondly, if to, to bring in a change in scenario, we have to really think that what have we done in all these 20 years and why it has not worked. So that analysis, I think, is pending. And if we really look into it and see, then we may be able to pinpoint something that will improve this further. But as I said, that the, from the time that I came in science and now there is a, there is a hell of a lot of difference. This, the system is self-correcting itself in a way. But uh, I think we need to be more proactive to, to increase, to change this scenario. So, uh, I mean, it's up to people like you who can actually, you know, look into this and tell us that what we need to do. So, is there any more question? I have a comment. Yes, and, uh, Please continue, sir. And uh, that is that if I look at the BSc honors physics students in Delhi University, in the last uh, 15, 20 years, there is a tremendous increase, in my opinion. Uh, maybe a Delhi University College uh, teacher can tell me, can correct me if I'm wrong. Tremendously large number of students who are women, fractional number of students, they are women. Second point that I would like to make is that uh, with technology now, that work from home that has been quite successfully implemented in our country, uh, we can have programs by women who decide to stay at home and can work from home and contribute to science, education, and uh, to the society at large. So therefore, uh, this work from home culture, the lectures also delivered to home through the internet, and uh, this can go a long way in uh, helping, in, in motivating women to not only to teach, to participate, but also to learn and advance in their career. So this was just a, that technology is certainly going to help us in a very, very big way. It has already helped in the last four or five years, but I think it will play a very, very important role if we implement this technology in a very nice way, uh, in a very positive way. And uh, then more women who decide to stay at home can, can contribute to this society in a much more effective manner. This was just an observation, but I greatly enjoyed your talk, Professor Shah. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Professor Gattar. Thank you. There, there is a tremendous difference in subject-wise also. Like in when we were a student also in, in physics, in our whole class, there were only two girls. And then when I teach here, means in our whole department, there are only two female faculty. But uh, in other departments, uh, in, especially in biotechnology, the ratio is much better. So for long, I used to think that it may be that in mathematical sciences, it's it's less, but that's not the case with the computer science. There are so many. So, I mean, it may be a very complex thing, but what creates this difference and how to change that? I mean, because in physics and mathematics, it's very bad, but computer science is also a allied subject and it's mathematics. But in computer science, there is a good number of, a large number of female faculty. So if you have any idea, I mean, or any study I means which put lights on, how, how the difference comes in this specific subject? Uh, I'm not sure if there is uh, there are any studies on this. Uh, I have not really checked that. But uh, computer science, uh, why computer science should have more women? Uh, and uh, why not in other, you know, traditionally, uh, life sciences is where most yes. of the women have been there. You know? so, but the scenario is changing now. And we, I'm, I'm not sure if there are any documented evidence that there is a particular tilt of women going into, into computer sciences other than physics or chemistry or other disciplines. So I will not, I shall not be able to answer this question. Any, any other question or queries, remark, anything to continue with the discussion? So, if not, let please please continue. Hello, 
Uh, yes, 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 ma'am. Yes, you are now now visible. You know, I really enjoyed the each and every sentence of the lectures. Thank, Thank you, you so Shadriva. much. It is very well prepared, very, and this is the high time for this type of lecture. I have only few few queries and to make that what is in the last twenty years, whatever we have seen that there is a decrease of the female students in the upcoming of the career. The way you mentioned about the Marie Curie and others, especially the uh, Indian doctors uh, are, are in creating so many different medical institutes, which is not known even by all of us. It's yes. very well written, but one thing I'm worried we are talking about the loss of a lot of persons after having the first child or I th you also mentioned about the uh, societal, the communal and the harmonic relationships to develop, to grow the child. But, and we are also talking about the requirement of those particular uh, women scientists that having crash having better facility for last 20 years. But have you checked how many institute or the university or has a crash like NII? I have seen that many of my younger colleagues face the difficulties and having the problem. Yes, you know. talking about to give this is, but why not it is coming up? And second thing, uh, this is my feeling that to come up with the ladies in the very highly passionate intellectual and do something, being in the science community, you need a little bit pushed from the home uh, when you are young, maybe from father, maybe from mother, or maybe for somebody else who is looking for the upcoming but that push in the early childhood create a search for the women's people, search for the young girl to become the number one. Maybe in the administrative, maybe in the teaching, maybe in the technologist, whatever it is. This thing to be highlighted. And the NEP, the, what you said is fine, but the NEP program, the curriculum and the, is it compatible? That has to, has to be answered by the academies. Who else can mention? This is yes. my comments. Thank you, Chandrima. It's a very well documented since it is in YouTube um, lecture. It's very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, you know, about the, you are, you are talking about the crashes not being there in institutes. You know, a, this, uh, we have actually this Gati, the Gati program, they have come out. It is similar to what is called the Athena Swan program in, uh, in uh, Australia, that if an institute provides facilities to women, they will get brownie points in terms of funding and all that. So if that, that sort of institutionalizes actually uh, uh, an effort that uh, there should be this thing. I have seen in very few institutes actually having crash. I mean, NII incidentally now don't have a crash. I mean, it was there, they couldn't sustain it. But I've seen in IIT Gandhinagar, they have a wonderful uh, arrangement for, for people keeping their children over there, feeling safe about it, both the, both the father and the mother. So these are things that we need to really enforce. At some point of time, we need to enforce. I mean, it doesn't happen just by, you know, just by saying. So this enforce, if, if these institutes do get points for providing these facilities, which is actually good, not only for women, it's also good for men because it's a family we are looking at. So um, I hope that this will happen in future because for 20 years we have done this and it, in, in, the, in the higher, uh, in, during t in teachers, professors, the number is less as compared to the number of women getting into the science streams. So that is a problem, actually. Somewhere there is a watershed. So hopefully. It should be some binding of the institutes or yes. the university to provide. 
and the, to provide fun, financially also. Yes. You have needed yes. support. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is the... Madhu. Uh, this is Madhu Dixit. Uh, hello, hello. Hi, Chandrima. Uh, congratulations Hi. for a wonderful talk which you gave, and very, very Thank inspiring you. and motivating. I was just wondering that although do we do have different support programs for women to re-enter science, but sometimes I feel that they also need some programs to actually sustain in science. Some especially. Yes. Yes. So maybe like during your time, if such recommendation can go to different uh, secretaries in science, I think it will be very, very helpful. Although you mentioned, uh, I'm also aware that there are programs. No, there are programs, but you know, that finishes after an X amount of time. And at that age, it is very difficult for anybody, for whether a man or a woman, to get into, you know, a stream. So the, the, this, the program to sustain them are beyond a certain point, this is the same issue with the postdocs. Yes. You know, that the postdocs we have, we do not have a program to sustain them for years, you know. And we have a, we have a trained manpower there. And many yes. of them are without uh, jobs. So this is something, these are problems that we discuss. And so it really not, doesn't get done. But some things, little things trickle in. Yes, so, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is improving, no doubt. But I yeah. feel that if, if it is like women force is better utilized, yes, it will be really useful yes. for the country. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. sure. Thank you. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mitta. Yes. You know, it was a wonderful lecture. Uh, thank, thank you. you, thank you. I thank just you. wanted to inform you that, you know, in Anirban Patak's question that why they change subjects or why in different subjects are different equities. Initially, it was mm -hmm. in biological sciences, but not many later on in the engineering. At least what I'm seeing now in our own center, research center, Bhava Atomic Research Center, there are three major divisions and the groups are being held, they're headed by ladies, Dr. Mrs. Archana Sharma, Dr. Mrs. Anita Behere, and they are heading beam technology development, laser system, system, electronics and instrumentation groups, and the nuclear recycling group. So what the more important things. So I think this is not very clear how it happens, which is it division wise, it is subject wise, it is the how it is happening by year by year, there are a lot of study needs to be done. Yes. Yes, the real, to point out the real uh, difficulties that we are having, we need to uh, do some more studies. And I'm also, I'm not sure if they have done this, that in these 20 years of having women-friendly programs, have the programs been evaluated? That yes. And questionnaire to people who have use these programs, what are the difficulties they are yeah. facing? How can we solve them? So I'm not sure if that kind of studies have been done. Yeah. <coughs> so any, any more question or comment? <coughs> so if not, let us thank the speaker once again and close this thank, evening Thank talk. you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Patak and Dr. Choudhury. Uh, and we'll soon announce the next talk. Uh, thank you.